All right, folks, welcome to CFAM's panel on, uh, on sexual reproductive rights. I am, uh, I'm just gonna introduce the panel and I'm gonna step away. Uh, we regret that we're having this terrible, um, inexcusable uh, technical glitch. We will fix it for next time. Um, one of the uh, most nettlesome issues that we face at the United Nations, and we have since before uh, Cairo and Beijing 24, 25 years ago, is over the question of sexual and reproductive health, the purposes of which are to advance uh, a global right to abortion. Uh, what we know is that um, the other side wants to sprinkle the phrase in dozens and hundreds and thousands of documents in order to do two things, uh, to advance an argument that there's a customary international right to abortion through the repetitious use of a phrase, um, sexual and reproductive health, and, and also to, um, to use it as uh, a directive uh, from UN headquarters with regard to the spending of money uh, around the world in, in the promotion of abortion. Uh, two of the global experts on, uh, on sexual and reproductive health um, happen to work at CFAM, and they have learned their expertise um, at CFAM. Both of them have been with us for a very long time. Uh, one of the great things about CFAM is, is that people come to CFAM and they tend to stay uh, because there's a very strong sense of mission. Um, we're in this to stop a global right to abortion, to stop a global redefinition of a family and, and so many other agenda items of, of the sexual left. Um, today, you're gonna be hearing from Rebecca Oes, uh, PhD, uh, who came to us many years ago and, and she, She's our research director, and she knows this as well as anybody in the world. Uh, we're also going to be joined by Stefano Gennarini, who um, has a law degree from uh, the University of Notre Dame, also been with us for many, many years. Uh, many delegations um, rely upon his expertise um, uh, in negotiating documents and understanding phraseology and coming up with better language um, in organizing um, and so you're going to be hearing from both of them in different aspects of sexual reproductive health. So I don't know who's going to go first, but I'm going to turn it over to the first speaker. I'm going to step away and I'm going to, alas, I'm going to listen just like you rather than watch. Uh, but I promise you, we will fix this. This will not happen again. Um, so take it away, uh, Rebecca or Stefano. Hi, uh, thank you, Austin. And, uh, well, Lisa's working on the on the technical glitch. Hopefully, we'll get uh, we'll resume uh, video at some point as we're talking. Um, in the meantime, um, um, we can we can start talking about um, this concept of uh, sexual reproductive health and rights, which is a fairly new concept in UN policy, um, and it's um, uh, it's only been around for the last five or six years, really. Um, although it it has a it has a, a longer pedigree or history, and um, and Rebecca can really help us um, break it down because she's researched this like few have. Um, so Rebecca, I think the first thing we should start with really is what is um, sexual and reproductive health, or as it is commonly known, SRHR, um, the acronym. You know, here at the UN, we're very big at on acronyms. Um, so what is SRHR, Rebecca? Can you tell us? Sure. Well, so I, I want to begin um, by talking a little bit about the 1994 International Conference on Population and Development, or the ICPD. That was the, the conference in Cairo, where there was really a concerted effort to try and establish an international human right to abortion. And that effort was blocked by a coalition of countries, many predominantly Catholic and Muslim countries. Certainly, uh, Pope John Paul II played a pivotal role in that. And there were a couple of terms that were accepted in the outcome of that um, and defined in that document. And those two terms are sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights. And you will notice that those two terms make up some of the components of sexual and reproductive health and rights, but there's one critical piece that's missing and that is any notion of sexual rights. Um, that was not accepted by the countries and in that consensus and remains something that has never been accepted at the UN by consensus. And so, um, so the, the terms sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights were both accepted and defined 
in the ICPD outcome um, and did not include a, a, an international human right to abortion. Um, that was the consensus, that was the compromise that was struck at that conference. Um, the term sexual and reproductive health and rights or SRHR was never accepted. Um, and you know, for, for various reasons, including the, the, the fact that sexual rights was not acceptable. Um, but it has also never been defined in any UN document. And so, um, you know, th there's the question of what it contains, um, you know, notionally, but also how it's defined. And so for many years, it has been promoted um, sort of as a workaround, as a way of insinuating a right to abortion, as well as other controversial topics, which we can get into later. Um, but there was never a formal definition of it for many years, even while it was being promoted. And the consensus has still held from ICPD to the present day, which is that there is no international human right to abortion, that it is for member states to set their own laws on this. Um, so so, so let, let, let's, let's just clarify here for everybody, because maybe some people are listening here and you said ICPD, here's another big acronym from the United Nations. And people are like, whoa, what does that mean? Well, ICPD refers to the International Conference on Population and Development, which took place in 1994 in Cairo. And it was a monumentally important conference in UN history, simply because it was the first time that abortion got into UN policy. That is a UN policy agreed by member states in an intergovernmental negotiation. Um, and But the, the reason why um, abortion got into UN policy was um, that, you know, of course, the Clinton administration at the time was promoting abortion. Uh, they actually went into the conference uh, wanting to get a, a declaration that abortion was an international right. Um, thankfully, uh, uh, Pope John Paul II at the second, now St. Uh, Pope John Paul II, um, um, he, he, um, he did a, you know, a full court press uh, campaign internationally, getting people involved to oppose uh, a declaration of an international right to abortion. And a lot of countries fought back against the notion of an international right to abortion. So, so the Clinton administration did not manage to get an international right to abortion in the, in the International Conference on Population Development, also known as ICPD. Um, and in fact, what happened was, um, in, a, in a real reversal of uh, fortunes, um, the actual outcome, conf the, the actual outcome, the document that came out of these negotiations actually cast abortion in a negative light. And so it includes very important caveats on the issue of abortion. First and foremost, that abortion is exclusively something to be decided in national, um, according to national uh, uh, legislation, uh, without external interference. So in, in a sense, it really should preclude um, international agencies, um, UN agencies, um, foreign countries from interfering in internal abortion policies uh, and politics. Um, moreover, it-, it, Stefano, it, it Yes? Stefano, um, I just sent both of you an email of a screenshot uh, that shows that you guys both need to give permission to do video. Somewhere on your screen will be a thing that says, do video. Okay. There you are. Here I am. All right, Matt, Rebecca, you have one too. You can unblock your own video. Start video, is that all you pushed? Yeah, just start the video. I'm still saying that my host has blocked it. She, uh, Rebecca still says this, she's blocked. Uh, that Lisa's is false. Uh, I sent you an email that shows a I'm camera that has a red line through it. Somewhere on your screen, you have to give permission for video. I'm seeing your screenshot, just give me one second. Stefano, perhaps you can tell her where that is. Well, I, I just uh, uh, I just pressed the start video button. That's all I did. Uh, that's in the lower left corner of my That's screen. right, on, on the lower left corner of the screen. And mine still says unable to start because the host has stopped it. Oh yes, mine says that too. It's because he's the, the host now. He, he has the power, I think, but we don't. Um, oh, brother. All right. Well, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, Lisa, Lisa can keep working out the, and see if, if we can get remove the technical glitch. In the meantime, we can keep going as, as we can. 
Um, so I, I was saying that, you know, in 1994, we had this monumental conference on the, in Cairo, uh, the International Conference on Population and Development, where, um, you know, UN member states agreed to include abortion in UN policy, but only with these very, you know, high, uh, strong caveats that abortion um, should not be considered an international right, that um, countries have the right to decide their own laws for themselves with regard to abortion, and that in actual, in actual fact, governments should help women avoid abortion, um, and um, that abortion can never be promoted as a method of family planning. Um, and so, you know, the, the conference really was a reversal of uh, the outcome that uh, abortion groups and the Clinton administration had been hoping for. And um, so, but ever since, um, abortion groups and their supporters here at United Nations headquarters have been trying to move past those caveats and move past the consensus reached in the International Conference on Population and Development. Something else that happened at that conference was that um, um, the notion of uh, rights on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity or LGBT rights or um, rights based on homosexual preference and things like that were completely also excluded from that conference. And that's another thing that progressive countries um, and LGBT groups, powerful LGBT groups have been trying to, to get into UN policy ever since. And because they can't really make much progress in the intergovernmental negotiations between countries, because so many countries in actual fact have socially conservative mores and quite socially conservative laws. Um, they, they have been trying to advance their agenda through the UN bureaucracy and through the UN agencies, which are largely beholden to powerful donor countries that have progressive agendas. Um, because of this, um, even though they have, you know, progressive countries and the abortion and LGBT groups have not made any progress in, at the United Nations normatively, in the agreements adopted by countries, they have made a lot of progress through the UN bureaucracy um, and the UN secretariat, which have hold a lot of power. And, you know, um, CFAM has been warning of this for, you know, 20 years now. And one of the first papers that uh, uh, Austin wrote as president of CFAM, this was back in 1999, was a uh, dangerous mischief at the United Nations. And it was all about how UN agencies have a, an incredible amount of power, especially when it comes to smaller countries and the ability to pressure them to change their laws. So therefore it, it really is it's significant that um, UN agencies and the secretariat are um, overstepping the agreements of the General Assembly that were reached in, in, in 1994 uh, on the issue of abortion to promote abortion quite aggressively um, in many countries. Um, at, but Having said all this, what the what the UN agencies, um, what the secretariat, and what the pro progressive countries want now, uh, since they they have been promoting abortion, is validation of what they have been doing, um, and in fact, they want normative support to go even further, um, and that's where this term sexual and reproductive health and rights comes in, because in 1994 the General Assembly, or well, most of the member states of the General Assembly at the International Conference on Population Development, they, de they developed very clear um, definitions of sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights in this UN agreement uh, called the International Conference on Population Development. And they, in that agreement, they included all these caveats uh, against abortion that cast abortion in a negative light. Um, and as well as uh, other caveats with regards to protection of sovereignty, respect for, for culture, um, um, uh, respect for parental guidance in uh, the education of children, including their, uh, their access to things like sexual and reproductive health. And, uh, and because all these caveats are there, um, the, there, there's been a concerted attempt to move past that. And the way to do it is to create this new term that has never been defined, which is sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights, which melds together two separately defined terms in the International Con Conference on Population Development, which are on the one hand, sexual and reproductive health, and on the other hand, reproductive rights. While the two are related to each other, they are defined separately. And one of the reasons for that was to exclude 
precisely the notion of sexual rights, which many countries found offensive at the time and they still find offensive and controversial um, today. And, um, and so that's, that's where we find ourselves. And I, I think one of the most interesting things about this terminology of sexual reproductive health and rights is that even though countries have not adopted it in, in agreements negotiated by countries here at the United Nations, the UN bureaucracy, um, as well as powerful NGOs that work in this field of sexual reproductive health, um, abortion, LGBT rights, um, they are all using this term as if it were already normative, as if it were adopted by the General Assembly. Um, I don't know, Rebecca, if, if you can address that a little bit and, and, and talk about a little bit about how organizations, who's, who's actually using this term, sexual reproductive health and rights? Okay. Hold on one second, Stefano. I think I found a solution. At the top of your screen, you'll see meeting, view, edit, window, help. Do you see it? On the top bar of your screen. At the top bar. It says zoom.us meeting. Up near the Apple logo. Yeah. Can you see meeting? Yeah. Click on meeting. Scroll down to start share, since you're now the host. That's, I think that's just going to share my screen. Give it a shot. Yeah, oh, it's going to share your screen. Okay. Never mind. All right. It was a shot. Uh, Rebecca, do you want to try and start? And and um... that's it's right. Okay. Um, so, so uh, just getting back to where this term sort of came from. Um, it. Two years after the Cairo conference in 1996, there was a meeting um, held in Glen Cove, New York, and it was basically UNFPA and the, the women's and human rights divisions of the UN, the modern versions are the Office of the High Commissioner for the Human Rights and uh, the UN Women. And they held a meeting basically to, um, to promote sexual and reproductive health and rights. And they even had that phrase in the title of the meeting. So this is just two years after this term was, was rejected. Um, and they decided really to promote this through the treaty monitoring bodies at the UN. And so no sooner did this meeting happen that the treaty bodies really started aggressively pressuring countries to liberalize their abortion laws and to consider sexual orientation and gender identity as grounds for non-discrimination. Um, and once these terms started to make it into their recommendations to countries, they would then be quoted by different UN agencies, including the uh, UNFPA, WHO, OHCHR, you know, all these different acronyms, all the different agencies. They could just quote the treaty bodies and then they would quote each other. And so the term basically made its way throughout all of the bureaucracy, like Stefano said. And, you know, and obviously it was being echoed left and right by the big international organizations, uh, the NGOs like Planned Parenthood, Marie Stopes, all the ones who had been lobbying very hard for a right to abortion at Cairo and ever since. And so, um, you know, some of their efforts have been really insidious. Back in November of 2019, uh, UNFPA had a, a summit in Nairobi, Kenya, that was to commemorate 25 years since the ICPD conference. And they included the phrase SRHR several times in their largely predetermined uh, statement, which was not a negotiated um, statement. It was the result of, as they call it, global consultations. So again, they're, they're sort of sidestepping around the need for consensus. And they justified the use of the term by pointing out that it had appeared in uh, you know, the UNFPA's strategic plan that had been approved by their executive board. So sort of a, a, a document that was not really for public consumption at all. Um, but the point is that even in this, even when, you know, in that plan and in the, the, the statement from Nairobi that quoted it, there was still no definition. There was no formal definition um, of what this even means. And so there was now this effort underway to try and define this term um, outside of UN consensus so that then when it's used in documents as they hoped it would be, uh, there would be a pre-existing definition to loop back to. And that um, that we can discuss, you know, was basically done in a Lancet Guttmacher Institute commission um, that was launched in May of 2018. And so, so, so just explain what a Lancet uh, Guttmacher commission is for, for all, those, all the people listening who, who aren't familiar with it, because it's, it's, a, it's a pretty um, um, big deal that a, a Lancet commission would, would would do something on SRHR. 
Well, so the Lancet, of course, is the prestigious medical journal uh, from England that um, uh, you know certainly publishes a lot of you know technical papers as well as editorial comments on the field of global medicine. Uh, the Guttmacher Institute, of course, is the research facility that used to be part of Planned Parenthood in the United States before it was spun off as its own entity, which, of course, is unapologetically pro-abortion. And so, um, essentially, the Lancet and the Guttmacher Institute uh, worked together to come up with this, this commission whose stated purpose was to create a definition um, of SRHR. So, um, Obviously, this has not been done in consultation with member states writ large, um, but it is to date probably the most widely accepted and promoted definition of SRHR that's being used by organizations and countries that have long been promoting it even before this definition was put forth. And this is one of the things about, about the, the, the Lancet Commission that I found most baffling is that there really isn't much transparency in how um, you know this commission co comes about, and and how it, then it sort of feeds back into official um, um, bureaucratic processes of the United Nations, um, and 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 it's a common issue with a lot of research reports uh, published or prepared by um, staff of uh, the United Nations agencies, in particular the World Health Organization. Who, who will go in peer, uh, peer reviewed journals or um, you know, medical publications um, like The Lancet, and, and they will promote a specific political view, really, and then um, you know, distance themselves from it as saying, you know, well, this is not the official position of the World Health Organization. And um, at the same time, you know that you can see the, the real life effects of how the actual guidance developed uh, in the Lancet Commission with the Guttmacher Institute of all, you know, of all people, um, is actually being used by uh, the um, the World Health Organization uh, as practical guidance for for their work, um, and so there really isn't much transparency and there really isn't any accountability. There's no way um, for UN member states to effectively put a stop to this. It's it's in many ways it really is a runaway bureaucracy. And, but just to get to the substance of what, what is SRHR about? What is sexual reproductive health and rights about? What, it, what, are, what are we actually talking about? Because um, a lot of people think, oh, well, sexual reproductive health, it's a good thing, right? We're talking about maternal health. We're talking about um, uh, family planning. Uh, we're talking about um, child, um, you know, um, um, medical care for mothers and their children when the children are, are for newborns. Um, so what are we actually talking about when, when, when we talk about sexual reproductive health and rights? How is it defined? Well, it has uh, multiple parts of it. Um, I think, you know, obviously, like you said, there are some parts of it that are not controversial at all, um, you know, including deciding whether, when, and whom to marry, um, having, you know, your, your um, you know, obviously good maternal and child health, treatment of various reproductive type cancers um, and freedom from you know, sexual violence and coercion. I mean, these are things that of course would have universal consensus by member states if they were promoted you know, on their own. The problem is that this whole package contains a lot of things that are not acceptable to member states that have been individually rejected repeatedly, um, including one, one uh, thing that it states as a human right is to freely define one's own sexuality, including sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. Um, another thing that it says, you know, it should be included as a right is safe and effective abortion services and care. Um, you know, uh, also comprehensive uh, sexuality education, which is another very controversial topic. And, um, you know, it also has a, a segment where it says that it is a right to decide whether, when, and by what means to have a child or children, um, which becomes problematic when you look at it in the light of the entire commission, which is a you know much longer document that talks a lot about uh, um, assisted reproductive technologies, including things like sperm donation, you know, um, in vitro fertilization, and so to to say that one has a right to have a child by what means one prefers, um, you know, obviously opens the potential door to a lot of exploitation, especially as we've seen from the surrogacy industry and the, um, you know, the egg uh, market for, for eggs. So there's a lot of potential problems there as well. 
So I, I just want to clarify on the issue of, uh, you know, the LGBT agenda, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity that, you know, CFAM, uh, we don't believe that, um, you know, we believe that every individual human being possesses inherent dignity and worth, um, and uh, including individuals who identify as, sec um, as, uh, as homosexual, lesbian, gay, uh, transgender, everybody deserves to be respected um, and every, everybody possesses the same human rights. Um, but what we don't um, believe is that there are um, obligations in international law with regards to protection of, um, for example, uh, homosexual conduct. Um, or um, there is no obligation in international law for countries to recognize uh, gender identity changes. Um, and so uh, we, we just want to we want to distinguish, you know, what it is a legitimate human rights agenda, which is protecting every individual um, member of the human family um, with the with the same rights, with the same dignity and respect. Um, and with and 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 that's something entirely different from um, declaring that homosexual conduct is protected under uh, international law or that international law requires um, individuals to be able to change their uh, their gender identity uh, based on their subjective feelings uh, instead of any um, objective scientific scientific uh, criteria um, and so that's what the distinction we want to uh, we want to make you know we're, we're not here we're not here to condemn anybody we're not here to to judge anyone um, but what we do want to make clear is that international law uh, does not create obligations with regards to, um, um, you know, protection of homosexual conduct or um, uh, gender identity changes. These are something that, um, you know, th these would constitute new special rights that have never been agreed by member states. Um, and then they carry uh, huge implications also for other uh, human rights, in particular, the right to religious freedom, freedom of speech, as we are seeing more and more around the world. Um, Individuals who object to uh, homosexual conduct because of uh, moral or religious reasons um, are being uh, canceled. Just today, I don't know if 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 any of you on the call today um, know Ryan Anderson, but uh, there's been a coordinated attempt by Amazon, uh, Apple, and, and Twitter to eliminate um, uh, Ryan Anderson, uh, Ryan Anderson's book, uh, When Harry Met Sally, um, yeah. and. Um, you know, which is about the transgender agenda. So there's a there's a real concerted effort to silence any kind of religious or differing view on these issues. Any any possibility of, of saying even that um, that there's any kind of fluidity in sexual orientation and gender identity, something which the social science on the issue, uh, as well as the uh, scientific, there's other scientific evidence bears out uh, amply. Um, and so what we really want to want to do is make sure that we, we minimize conflicts between rights and, and, and that we hold fast to an authentic interpretation of human rights on these issues. Sorry for that long winded digression there, but I, I just wanted to make it clear in case somebody here thinks that, you know, we're here about we're here to condemn or, or that we want draconian penalties uh, for individuals who engage in homosexual conduct or openly live in a homosexual lifestyle. Um, you know, th that's not what we're arguing for, here for, but we're simply saying that um, a lot of what the LGBT agenda is doing internationally is, is not so much uh, calling for respect of the human rights, uh, existing human rights of individuals who identify as LGBT, as much as uh, tr seeking to impose social acceptance of um, um, LGBT um, issues um, uh, without any political legitimacy um, and, and frankly, without any regard also for existing uh, and recognized rights like the freedom of uh, religion, freedom of speech. Um, and and, and, that, and that's a, that, that can bring us a little bit uh, again to, 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 to understand who exactly is uh, promoting this term, uh, sexual and reproductive health. We saw that the Lancet Commission uh, was, was, was used it um, but where where are we seeing the term coming up uh, repeatedly um, 
Rebecca, I mean, I know that we, we saw it repeatedly come up in, in, in negotiations, for example, in the, in the 2030 agenda, in 2014, countries were proposing it, uh, trying to get it in the 2030 agenda, but it, it's, they didn't get it into the 2030 agenda because um, most countries in the General Assembly said, you know what, let's stick to what was defined in 1994 with regards to sexual reproductive health and reproductive rights. Uh, let's not move uh, beyond that uh, and, and recognize this new notion of sexual reproductive health and, re and rights. Um, but where else have we seen it since? Well, I mean, certainly we see it in the reports from various UN entities. Um, the World Health Organization even has the srhr.org internet domain, um, you know, as a landing place for some of their materials. And so clearly they're promoting it. Uh, UNFPA, obviously. Um, and of course, you know, like I said, some of the, the NGOs that are very much in favor of abortion have been promoting it for a long time, you know, like Marie Stopes, International Planned Parenthood. Um, so, you know, it's it's being used in, in you know, th there's a very strong attempt to mainstream it, you know, to, to sort of elide the fact that it's not been accepted in the General Assembly. And so if you hear it enough times in enough places, you might think that it was already accepted. And uh, Stefano, I think it also is worth pointing out that even the Cairo consensus, you know, of sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights, there's been ongoing attempts there to, to move the ball forward on that um, by trying to say not only, you know, do we accept these terms in accordance with ICPD, but also with review conferences, which, you know, has been uh, taken to mean in some cases regional reviews that are not applicable to all regions of the world, but, you know, obviously some regions have a more, as they say, progressive view on this issue than others. So, you know, they really are pushing on all fronts, but I think it has to be stated just, you know, very clearly that to give way on this issue would be a colossal loss for the pro-life and pro-family movements, because for years and years, we have been, um, there we go. Hi. Um, Rebecca. So <laughs> For years and years, you know, we've been fighting on many different fronts against the right to, um, you know, to abortion as a human right, obviously, to sexual rights and everything that entails, also comprehensive sexuality education, um, and all of these different issues. And because they're all bundled up together in SRHR, if we were to accept that term in a negotiated document, we would essentially be handing the other side a win on everything all at once, as opposed to even just letting one of those terms in. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I found the most interesting, one of the most recent um, mentions was the Nairobi summit um, in, um, well, in Nairobi. <laughs> the Nairobi summit, of course, took place in Nairobi. But one of the things that they, they got, they, they spoke about there is specifically um, uh, expanding um, the definition of sexual reproductive health and rights and, and, uh, and expanding it by reference to the Lancet Commission. So, I mean, this, this is how it works. So they, they want to expand the, since they, they know they can't get what they want in the General Assembly. They know the General Assembly is gonna shoot down sexual rights. It's gonna shoot down sexual reproductive health and rights. And so what they do is they create a conference outside the UN framework of negotiations, which you know, have protections for smaller countries for their sovereignty. And, and they create an agenda in a UN conference in Nairobi, for example. Uh, and uh, it's, it's quite clear to everyone there that the agenda is to promote um, L social acceptance of LGBT issues, um, as well as uh, sexual autonomy for minors without regard for parental uh, guidance, um, as well as uh, abortion access. I mean, the, the, the Nairobi summit actually spoke about abortion as a humanitarian right. Um, and um, and, and, and you, you see this uh, repeatedly with these UN conferences, and we're, we're going to see this again at the Generation Equality Forum, which uh, is going to take place this year, which is another major conference that's going to be organized by UN Women, UNFPA, other UN agencies, alongside the governments of Mexico and France. And they're creating another conference outside the framework of the General Assembly, outside the framework of the UN Charter, and, and uh, to, to basically push their agenda forward. And then the way that they're going to they're gonna get it into UN policy is through um, less transparent mechanisms. For example, the Nairobi summit came into UN policy through the UN executive board last year. The UN executive board uh, did a review of their strategic plan and they added indicators 
on performance on UNFPA goals that are based on the Nairobi summit specifically. And, and it's worded very broadly in a, in a way that it's clear that it includes everything, including redefining sexual reproductive health and rights to include controversial notions, um, access to comprehensive sexuality education, which is another very complex topic, which we can get into another time maybe, um, as well as you know the, 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 the the notion of uh, abortion as a humanitarian right. Um, and this is, this is now the policy of UNFPA. This is how they measure progress on the goals of um, UN policy. Um, and, and so, and, but there was never really any debate of, of discussing this uh, between member states. The General Assembly never had an opportunity to discuss this, but at the same time, bureaucratically, uh, through these less transparent mechanisms, they have been able to to create all these policies. Um, and, and so one of the questions I have is, um, what's gonna happen now with that we have a Biden administration? What's gonna happen with the, with the Biden administration, which we know they have declared that they want to promote sexual and reproductive health and rights. It's right there in the preamble, preambular paragraphs of their uh, executive order or the memorandum. Um, that was issued um, the first week that President Biden was in office uh, with regards to promoting sexual and reproductive health and rights. And uh, so we know they wanna promote this. And you know, the question on everybody's mind is what effect is it gonna have internationally? What effect is the added pressure? Because we know that the, United, the European Union is, is set on promoting sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, even though there are socially conservative countries like Poland and and Hungary and the European Union to, that should be able to block something so controversial, um, we have not seen any real effort from them from on their part to, to block the more controversial elements. Um, but uh, so, what do you what do you think, uh, Rebecca, about this? About the Biden administration is coming in, and what kind of uh, expectations can we have? And and do you think they they will be able to sh shake down enough countries? Um, to accept this new terminology? Well, I guess a couple of thoughts. I, I seem to recall that the Obama administration um, announced that it would promote the term sexual rights while at the same time sort of hedging on whether that actually created any new obligations. So they were at least willing to let it slide in documents, you know, assuming that it could get through otherwise. Um, while at the same time not necessarily wanting to obligate the U.S. in any particular way, because of course the U.S. is very mindful of what human rights obligations it acknowledges um, that it has. So to some extent, obviously the U.S.'s moral leadership on this is going the wrong direction, and that's very unfortunate. Um, but of course, these the consensus has held through past democratic administrations. So we hope that you know that countries with strong pro-life, pro-family laws will continue to hold the line. Um, but it is very troubling, you know. Um, well, I'll tell you one thing that you noted here about, you know, how generally the State Department tends to be conservative. And, it, and in some ways, it's very true because, um, you know, for example, the Obama administration didn't get on the sexual rights or sexual reproductive health and rights bandwagon until very late into the administration. Um, uh, even in the negotiations of the Sustainable Development Goals, um, the Obama administration never promoted sexual reproductive health and rights. It was only promoted by uh, some countries in Europe, um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, other progressive countries, um, as, as well as uh, certain Latin American countries that are progressive. But the United States was never on that side. They, they were sticking to the terms that were agreed in the International Conference on Population and Development in 1994. Um, and the interesting thing is that in the um, executive order or the memorandum that was um, issued in, uh, in January, um, the actual operative paragraphs that order the State Department and um, the U.S. Agency for International Development to work on sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights don't use the new terminology, sexual and reproductive health and rights. They actually use the term sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights um, which were agreed in the ICPD. So it'll be very interesting going forward to see what the actual positions that the, the Biden administration takes. Now, of course, now we still have no uh, nominees, political nominees in place at the US mission to um, advance the new agenda, if you like, of the Biden administration. In fact, in the, we know from, the, from debates going on at the Commission on the Status of Women that the United States hasn't really weighed in on this issue 
of sexual reproductive health and rights. And so we're everyone is waiting to see what happens with the United States, what positions they take. I mean, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, there's some lawyer that even, even though they might be progressive, progressive there within the State Department, they might have a, still a, a, an inkling of, uh, of respect for legality. And, uh, and they might say, well, you know what, actually, the terminology that we've always used and agreed in the General Assembly is sexual reproductive health and reproductive rights, and they're de defined related, relatedly but independently, so we really should keep them separate. Um, it remains to be seen if, if there are. Uh, maybe there's a good lawyer with a conscience in the State Department. That would be a wonderful thing. Um, well, would be great, and a brain as well. I think it, it also has to be really focused on here that how things become agreed is just as important sometimes as the fact that they become agreed at all. I mean, we've talked a lot about how the, there have been efforts by the bureaucracy to do an end run around the need for consensus. But there's also been recent signs that some of these progressive countries are getting so frustrated at their inability to secure this language by normal means that they're willing to blow up the need for consensus at all. Um, would you like to touch briefly on, on some of the, the warning signs of how that might be happening? Yeah, no, we, we saw this. Uh, there's been a, de a consultation going on about the working methods of the Commission on Population and Development and um, trying to get around the deadlock in UN policy on these contra controversial social issues, specifically access to abortion, a right to abortion, um, LGBT issues, uh, sexual autonomy for children. The, the, these issues always uh, cause uh, agreements, uh, negotiations to go on far into the night. Uh, causing headaches for everybody, for ambassadors, delegates. Um, and um, and in, in, the, in three of the last four years, the Commission on Population and Development, which, which actually um, is charged with the follow-up on uh, policies regarding sexual reproductive health agreed in, to, in the International Conference on Population and Development, um, hasn't even been able to, um, to come to an agreement in three of the last four years. Um, and so it's really a source of embarrassment for countries. It's a source of um, uh, really quite a shame even for the delegates who, you know, they have to go back to their capitals every year and say, well, we also this year, we couldn't reach an agreement. We couldn't come. And, you know, for diplomats that, you know, that's, that's, that's quite, um, that's quite a problem because their job is precisely to find compromises, to find agreements. And so the, the lack of an agreement is, is a big problem for them. And, um, but at, at the same time, uh, so you now you now we have there's a there's an entire group of countries, these progressive countries who are asking um, other member states to say, well, let, let's stop um, trying to reach an agreement. Let's just have a vote. You know, here in the United States, nations, um, as in most uh, international organizations, the gold standard for agreements is adoption by consensus. You want an a, a, a an agreement to be adopted by consensus without having to re, uh, make recourse to voting, without having any reservations. Um, but um, in order for that to happen, you can't have all the controversial stuff in there. And so now there are countries who are wanting to, to give up on the notion of consensus, to give up this gold standard for international agreements, which you know, the reason for it is, of course, is it has a lot of political legitimacy. When everybody can agree to something um, on the basis of consensus, it means everybody really thinks these are non-controversial things that we should all work on. And, uh, but now there are countries who are saying, let's give up on that. Let's give up on political legitimacy. And instead, we'll just uh, take votes. And, you know, it, it, in actual fact, because the, the po more powerful countries are the ones who are promoting this agenda, and because many developing countries are beholden to them, um, there is a real chance that a lot of these controversial items on this uh, sexual reproductive health and rights agenda can get through on a vote. Um, well, it's, it is a scary precedent to set, though, because once you've opened the door for this to be the way that things make it into to agreements, there's no real limiting principle on that. So, yeah, there isn't. I mean, it, it sets it's instead of the uh, the General Assembly as well as the multilateral system becoming a system for cooperation between uh, sovereign states on, on a basis of consensus and amicable relations. And, you know, it sort of becomes a zero sum game, like any partisan political process uh, where the most powerful get their way. And, um, you know, it, there's a real risk to undermine multilateralism here that, you know, the multilateral system is no longer a, about cooperation between states who are e equally uh, respected as sovereign, 
but it really is a top-down uh, system to impose social and economic uniformity, regardless of the objections of smaller states or states which have less power and money. Right. So I guess since we're getting closer to the end of our time, and I'm sure we want to entertain some questions from our, our viewers, um, just I think it might be useful just to kind of summarize what the the case against SRHR is in short. And I think you know I've written a, a definitions article that's available on our website if you'd like to read more about this. I'm going to link to it down here in in the comment section. I'm, I'm going to put the link uh, to Rebecca's paper. Um, but I think we what we can basically summarize what it is, what SRHR is is that it's, it's really all of the components of sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights that were adopted at the ICPD, you know, which are good in some ways, problematic in others. But to the extent that it doesn't duplicate what was already agreed at Cairo, it contains those elements that were explicitly rejected then and have been rejected ever since. So you know, all of the new things that would come in with it are, are the things that do not have consensus um, support at the UN and never have and are problematic in turn. And so the reason to oppose this term is basically that it would be to, to, to capitulate on multiple uh, very important issues for life and the family, um, for children and for, for maternal health and everything else all at once. And so it is important that member states hold the line in negotiations and not accept uh, changes to the, the ways that negotiations go forth that would allow this to, to slip in even on a vote. Um, because although that doesn't have the normative weight of a consensual declaration, you, you just know that if it got through under any circumstances at all into a negotiated document, it would immediately be echoed throughout the entire echo chamber of UN agencies, the bureaucracy, as well as certainly the organizations that have been clamoring for this for years. Yeah, and you, you know, CFAM, as well as other pro-life and pro-family organizations that have worked at the United Nations for many many decades now, um, you know, we've always been in favor of a positive outcome, but we are against uh, a negative outcome. And in, in, in many ways, uh, uh, the consensus base of adoption allows everybody to make sure that we do have a positive outcome. And the failure to reach agreement in recent years in the Commission on Population Development, for example, is clearly because of overreach by progressive countries who don't want to compromise at all. I mean, if they don't get their way, they are, there's no agreement. Um, and it, it, there's a question here from Matt. He says, he's from Ireland, and he says, why does the General Assembly allow UN entities to create their own agenda for promoting SRHR? And, and you know what? That's a really good question because it really dele delegitimizes the General Assembly. It takes away, it erodes the normative guidance of the General Assembly. Um, it dilutes uh, the agreements of the General Assembly. If every UN agency can create its own norms, uh, based on, you know, as, as long as they have a, a couple of donor countries, powerful donor countries funding their agenda, um, you know, as, as every UN agencies can go off and even the secretariat increasingly, they, they can create their own norms, um, regardless of what UN member states have agreed. Um, and it, it's a real problem, but it, it, it's, it's, it's sort of systemic right now because so many countries that are part of the United Nations, they don't feel that they have a say or that they don't e have an equal say, especially when it comes to policies like sexual and reproductive health. You have to understand, sexual and reproductive health is the number one item on the global health agenda. No other item receives the same amount of money, something in the order of something like $13 billion a year, which means that there's a lot of money going around. So there's a lot of interests there's a lot of lobbying on this issue. And um, therefore, it, there, there really is, um, and, and, and a lot of countries are beholden to this money. You know, there are gender ministries, there are health ministries that are receiving money from powerful countries in Europe, um, the, from the United States, from Canada. And, and, and these countries are receiving this money. It's very hard for them to turn around um, at the same time that they're be, being given us foreign aid and assistance and to say, well, no, thank you, but we don't want your agenda. It, it, it's very difficult. And so they always find themselves in a position to say, well, let's see how much of your, of the, your agenda we can accept. Um, it, but, but it's always a one-way stream. It's always a one-way stream and it's very progressive. And the, the progressive side tends to make more and more gains over time, um, especially when it comes to these piecemeal decisions through bureaucracy. So for example, you know, UN agencies and the secretariat, they openly call on each other to bypass state departments and you know, presidents offices 
to go straight to ministries in countries because they know that if you go to a ministry with some money and a program, the, the ministry in those countries is, is very likely to just say, okay, you know, we'll take the money, we'll start the program, and you know, they'll try and put some safeguards if they can. But in the long run, you know, it, are they, they're not really setting the agenda and, and therefore they're, they're unable to shape the policy going forward. And, and that's, that's, how, that's how you see the General Assembly um, allowing this abuse by UN agencies. It, it's simply the countries who, who would want to oppose this agenda, who would want to have an alternative agenda that's positive for families, for women's health, uh, for sovereignty, for the protection of life, um, many of these countries find themselves muzzled uh, by um, the money they're receiving from donor countries. There's, a, there's an interesting question uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the chat box. As CSW conclusions are not binding, what would be the consequences of SRHR uh, remaining in the agreed conclusions? What, what is the consequence of such a thing? There, it's, it could be very consequential. So one of the common things that you will hear European diplomats, um, Nordic diplomats, also American diplomats when they're on the progressive side is, oh, you know, UN agreements are non-binding. Don't worry. You know, you can put whatever you want in there and it's just non-binding. So you, you don't have to worry about it. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's one of those very silly tropes and disingenuous lies that are told uh, because in reality, UN agreements are very influential. First they of are binding the agencies. First and foremost, yes, exactly. First and foremost, they are binding on the agencies. So even if they're not directly binding on countries, they are binding on the agencies who are working in your countries. And therefore, if they have a mandate to uh, promote, for example, sexual reproductive health and rights, SRHR, um, they will interpret that mandate as broadly as possible, um, including all the elements of it, the LGBT agenda, children's sexual autonomy, LGBT rights, um, abortion access, etc. Um, so you 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 have to always factor in that the the agreements are in fact binding. They are binding on the UN system. Moreover, they they have an influence beyond the UN agencies themselves. They have an influence, for example, on other international mechanisms, including financing mechanisms. You know, the language that is agreed in UN agreements and is taken up by UN agencies becomes the boilerplate in development contracts, for example, with the World Bank or the, even the IMF. So you're, you're going to see that language repeated verbatim in these um, agreements to get money through the World Bank or financing for, um, moreover, every bilateral agency, which is far more money than the money that is channeled through the UN system, every exactly. bilateral agency bases their programs on UN policy, including USAID. The flip side of that question and then uh, we're heading toward, toward a, a hard break at noon. Um, the flip side of that is how consequential is it every time we block it? Oh, it's, it's, it's hugely consequential um, because uh, this is a war of attrition, if you like. And these normative battles at the United Nations, they're not a zero sum game. They're not one battle once and for all. They are a war of attrition uh, over inches of text that takes place over a long period of time. And um, um, you, you know, the, the, the forces that are promoting abortion, the LGBT agenda, sexual autonomy for children, this, the sexual left, if you like, they know they only have a window of opportunity in the next maybe 20 years, uh, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less to get everything they want, you know, a, a, an international right to abortion, LGBT rights, et cetera, et cetera because they know that the demography of the world is shifting very fast to low fertility and aging. And when that happens, you know what happens. Countries turn to become pro-natalist and they adopt policies that to incentivize having children, that to incentivize families, uh, to protect the family, and um, increasingly also to, um, to uh, protect life, for example, you know we're seeing you know in countries like Russia, for example, where you know abortion it was the first country to to legalize abortion, you know, with communism, um, and um, and you know they they for the first time in history in recent years have adopted some kind of regulation on abortion. Um, now you know we we may not see uh, abortion outlawed in in Russia, you know, in the, in the next five years, maybe not in the next ten years, but maybe we will. 
And, and, it, and it's a trend. And you will see that more and more across countries because low fertility and aging are a really scary phenomenon. And even, even the, the COVID pandemic will make people even more aware of this. When you turn around and you realize that there are four dogs and cats to every child born in this country, you know, that's, that, that, that was one of the wild statistics from Jonathan Last's book, uh, What to Expect When No One's Expecting a few years back. Um, you know, when you see that kind of thing, it, it's very scary. It's very scary. And countries are bound to wake up to the threat of uh, low fertility and aging. And simply so societies will give a, a, a more importance to, to children. And, and, and I think that's, that's the opportunity for the pro-life movement I internationally. Would also, I would just point out that um, Japan, who led the way in low fertility, has just established a minister for loneliness. Um, and that's that right. Yeah. When, when How sad. That he doesn't have children. And I just very quickly just respond very fast to what Austin brought up. You know, it, the problem I think for conservatives in a place like the UN is that every time we win the battle to keep these phrases out, you know, it's not like we can quote the absence of something in a future document as agreed text. If they were to get some of these phrases in even once, you know, it would be quoted, you know, everywhere. It would be it would be exploded across every document from every agency, they would be pushing all the harder to get it quoted in other places. And so for us, you know, it really is the question of uh, we have to win every time, you know, in order to maintain the win, whereas if they win it only once, it's, you know, the dam is broken. And so there is that 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 perennial difficulty of being conservative in these institutions. Uh, we are now approaching the 12 o'clock hour. Um, I want to thank everybody for uh, for joining in all over the world. I see it right there in my chat box. Uh, and thanks to uh, these two uh, global experts on all of this stuff. They know more than I do, and it's humbling. And you know how hard that is for me. Um, anyway, we will be back next month with another panel. Uh, we, I, I'm not quite, do we know what the topic is, guys? We don't yet. Uh, so I apologize. We're planning for it to be about surrogacy. Surrogacy, oh, that's a good one. Uh, so anyway, terribly sorry for the glitches in the beginning. We will fix that and we will see you next month. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.